how they had the chance to to feel and to see that other people that are involved in other domain are so happy and uh, uh, they want to share and, and in this way uh, we think to create a new society not only a workshop on a technique or a workshop on art or a workshop oh, definitely. for definitely uh, it was definitely. a real joy to be together and to share everything we know and to build together a new uh, lifestyle or a new idea yes. something new and uh, had that yes. help us with the input of uh, other perspective from outside and a lot of professors from different countries but now it's uh, unusual because i don't know how many people are in in this moment in uh, perhaps mihai can see the yeah, number yeah, i can we sent out registrations last night so we send personal invitations to anybody that registered for the class yeah. via the website so um, I'm tracking actually all that data to see because this is the first year that we had to do it this way um, oh, with the yes. virtual conference. But in addition, it, we're live on Facebook right now. I see the button nod. So um, uh, we've been getting handfuls of people. And then I've noticed like last night, whatever conference people maybe didn't catch um, has gotten like over three, 400 views. So it'll continue to be watched yeah, yeah. Um, through different yeah. social platforms so that's kind of nice it that's, gives it a continuum um, that's beyond us just being here together so definitely um, but welcome I think that welcome. is and i'll be honest oh, I, I tend to believe that people um consider more easily to um, view it over social media rather than uh, join effectively the Zoom meeting with the Zoom app and all of the technicalities that are uh, behind of it. Uh, indeed, social media is way uh, higher on the numbers of viewers than uh, we, we, we have actually with the, the, the Zoom app. Interesting. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's something. I've that been means. getting emails and a lot of people in different remote, more remote parts of the world just have technical difficulties for being able to do the Zoom. But um, if they're able to catch it later through their social media platforms, that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, so that's it'll excellent. It'll be continued to be viewed <laughs> even after today. But oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of that. So it's going to reach so many more people. Really, it's going to be universal. And, yes, and yes, yes. that's worth it. Is that so, the, uh, the you know, technology? opportunities always. Sorry. Yes, technology. <laughs> Indeed. It's a sort of delay. So it's difficult to synchronize a little bit and to interact uh, uh, quite uh, quick, but uh, I believe that uh, anytime and anywhere technology is uh, very useful and it's not used like it was necessary. And in Europe, we have an interesting program uh, uh, that uh, you can apply to uh, uh, receive some uh, funds uh, that means science with and for society. And uh, that is a part of uh, our talk. It's a part in a way of this trend to help people to understand science because science has such a um, um, new passion, new way, a new vocabulary and so on uh, because of the evolution of science itself. Definitely. It's difficult uh, to be perceived as a yes. value for the society. So we need to be more involved in this kind of interaction and we can do it because it's uh, in every, uh, let's say day, we can one per day or one per month, we can make su such, uh, not only in Atlantic. So I believe that it's uh, only a sort of uh, beginning of uh, a way in which person from different uh, uh, parts of the world can uh, bring together an important, uh, an important subject like water now because it's a huge subject itself it's not uh, necessary yes. for living it's more than that it's more than that yes. so it's yes, a real definitely. subject that need a lot of people to think and to be creative in this new field so definitely, definitely. i believe that it's a beginning of a new way of sharing information to the world. Uh -huh. Okay, we, I believe that we can start. Yes, okay. I want to let you know that your handouts that were sent, um, my technical team just now got them on the website this morning. Um, okay, excellent. So if you go excellent. to where your description is, they can download them from there. Um, but we'll also put them on a PDF. We have a PDF that's downloadable on the top of the page for the end. And so all Florine's information, your information, anything more that you want to share, 
um, people will be able to access that information there. So it is up, so you can oh, let everyone know super. it's accessible. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, our, we're, we're live, obviously. <laughs> we're still okay. live. So. Uh, uh, Mihai, <laughs> we are live now on Facebook. Mihai? Okay, yes, let's we start. Are. Oh, okay, <laughs> we're good, we're good. Okay, yeah. well, so... Um, so again, uh, I just want to uh, thank everybody. Thank, uh, let's get, get going here. I'll set up here. So I, I do want to first thank uh, the organizers of Atlantic Cron, of course, Summer Academy 2020. Uh, excellent, excellent. New Horizons, UNESCO, and the World Genesization, you've all done a wonderful job. And thank you again for inviting me to talk to you today about water. Uh, thank you, Florin, Heather, Soren, uh, team, everybody who's put this all together. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful conference. And today, I guess, is the last day yes. uh, of something quite, quite wonderful. You've had uh, amazing, amazing people on. And, and I'm just uh, very uh, honored to be one of them. Um, so I'm going to the sharing uh, a PowerPoint here and see if that works. Okay. Uh, you'll, have to, you'll have to tell me if it's working. What it's do you working. guys see? <laughs> we see, we see, see it's like my uh, desktop. I, I uh -huh. see something is very close to my desktop. <laughs> We can see your <laughs> It's the same. You it's can same. see my desktop. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well I don't I don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah, you, you um, need to... Great. Oh your PowerPoint's coming up. We can yeah. see that. Oh, is it? Okay, that's great. It's that's like what we need working. to see. Beautiful. Oh, there it is. Perfect. You can start it. Okay. I don't see it starting. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's kind of weird. Um, to make sure we hit. It says we're we're viewing your screen. Um, hopefully, you're being able to. Yeah, see. You can. Okay. Uh, you, um, no, sorry. no, no, no. You can stop a little bit uh, uh, sharing the screen and start uh, first uh, uh, your power uh, your presentation. And after that, uh, you you can uh, deal with the presentation without any problem. Because now you cannot see your um, uh, your position of the, your mouse to start it. Oh, okay. Make now. Um, uh, do, oh, do you see it? Do you still yes, see it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right? Okay. So um, there's a slide. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about water uh, uh, in in all facets and and uh, basically from different angles. Uh, of meaning, the meaning of water. And much of what I'm going to talk about is, is from this book, Water Is, The Meaning of Water, came out in 2016 with Pixel Press. And it, it essentially parses out 12 main angles of how water is, is viewed by uh, various cultures, various individuals, scientists, uh, visionaries, uh, expertise that people with expertise spirit, spiritualists and and ordinary folk so uh, i'm going to continue um yeah it's not letting <laughs> for some reason i'm not able to so you're not seeing your screen just wondering if me yeah i don't see that okay so have we moved have we moved to the next slide no 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 we're still on the first slide. No, yes, in this slide, moment, okay. Yeah. Oh, hang on, here we go. All okay. right. Oh, yeah. You still see it? <laughs> you yeah. see it better now, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's all about one button. It's always about one button. Right? <laughs> you got it. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, so, um, the, you know, that question is relevant still today. Uh, from when we started looking at water. What, what is water? And I want to share with you one of my favorite quotes by D.H. Lawrence. Water is H2O, hydrogen two parts, oxygen one. But there's also a third thing that makes it water. And nobody, 
knows what it is. <laughs> and that is, <laughs> oh dear, that's still very relevant today to us scientists. It's quite interesting. So water is magic. This is a lovely quote as well by Lauren Isley. If there is magic on this planet, it's contained in, in water. And um, I am a limnologist and I study water and in all facets. So if we look at water, uh, oops. Just gonna get my notes again. So we see that you know water is the second most common molecule in the universe, and stars actually create water. Is that not the coolest thing? I love that idea. <laughs> or, <yeah. laughs> the stars create water. That's so I mean, water is is literally everywhere. Uh, it's currently on Mars. We we're finding it now on other planets. And Tesla, of course, had to go there and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I want to show uh, a brief video. I have a couple of videos here that essentially um, highlight some of the weirdest properties of water. Water has over 70 anomalous properties and these in fact are all life-giving and they are amazing properties. In, in other words, what an anomalous property is in this case for water is, water of course has three states, solid, liquid, gas, and water is anomalous or different from all others as in each of those phases and in changing from phase to phase. You can imagine it. So it's different than, than all other solids. As a solid, it's different than all other liquids, et cetera, that sort of thing. So let's just look at a couple and I'll just play this uh, short video. If you have uh, more than one video, uh, it's uh, difficult to, uh, we need to make a modification because uh, we have no, not sound. And you need to uh, set Oh, there's no sound. No sound, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we need to oh. stop, uh, please stop sharing. Please stop sharing oh. on the bottom <laughs> of your screen. And you need to, to um, do something in the moment when you start sharing. It's uh, something uh, on the uh, bottom of uh, these uh, windows that appear there, just to say, uh, share the sound of your computer. Without that, we don't hear you. That's uh, you I don't know how to do that. No, uh, stop. It's, uh, if you move the, on the top of the, your screen, you see there. Uh, um, stop uh, sharing. Stop sharing. There's, there's a button when you share the video that should say connect your, your audio as well to your computer. And that way we can hear the audio. The pictures are beautiful though. Oh, <laughs> darn. <laughs> well, I can just talk over. Um, <clears throat> essentially, it's, it's, you know, it's talking about how water is, shows cohesion and adhesion. So cohesion, they're talking about cohesion here looking at the water molecule. So water molecules made up of two hydrogen, one oxygen. And because of their arrangement, the electromagnetic 
you know, electromagnetic, I can't even say that. There, there's a, it's polarized. It's polarized because it's negative and positive. And of course, this makes them connect to each other. So opposites attract. So the oxygen sticks to the nearby hydrogen. So the result is a strong bond. It's a hydrogen bond. The surface tension is a result of cohesion. And they're showing how difficult it is for an insect to pull out, pull out of water. And you can see it stepping. And an insect struggling to free itself from a drop of water. So water is a spherical shape because of this cohesion. So it's the most cohesive of non-metallic non liquids. So adhesion is, the, is also the same thing, but it's water attracted to other surfaces. So you can see why it sticks to the leaf. So adhesion is also responsible for capillary action. This is the force that pulls water up against gravity. It's an essential property for plants, of course. Amazing. So water is important. Humans rely on it for consumption, for industry, energy production, and agriculture. But we sometimes use more than we need and pollute what's left. We need to make sure that we keep it pure and plentiful. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. I was just calmly listening to it. <laughs> so there you go. There's some beautiful and pictures are worth a thousand words. So oh, they are. And in some cases, you don't need it to say anything, but it's good to do so. Yeah. yeah so again, just. Um, to reiterate, water has over 70, has, uh, scientists have found 70 anomalous properties. And uh, it's, uh, NASA discovered the largest water vapor reservoir around a black hole 12 billion years from Earth. Wow. It contains 140 trillion times as much water as all the water in the Earth's ocean. So we have lots of water in the universe. The suns and the other stars like it create the equivalent of 100 million times the water than is in the Amazon River every second. Every second. Just think about that. So uh, as I mentioned, water is found in at least 23 places in the solar system, including Moon, Mars, uh, of course, Mercury, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus and Saturn's and Jupiter's moons, and Saladus is an exciting one. And water arrived on Earth in comets and asteroids some 4.5 billion uh, or 3.1 years ago during a period called the late heavy bombardment. Um, all right, so let's keep going. Ah, the water bridge. So in 2007, uh, Dr. Elmar F. Fuchs and Professor Jakob Voisitschlager showed that when they subjected two adjoining beakers of water to a voltage charge, uh, about 15 kilovolts, the water climbed the sides of each beaker to meet. Then they moved the beakers apart and they stuck, forming essentially a cylindrical water bridge that stretched over 2.5 centimeters. So I'm gonna show again another little video of what this looks like. So the vis is actually quite stunning. Once jolted, the two water bodies are going to appear rope for one another, trembling like two shocked children holding hands. Look at that. <laughs> I 
that's that's an am amazing distance there of course they're dancing because of the electrical charge but they're staying together yeah i was gonna it almost looks like this is so this is a, a uh, yeah yeah so this is a function of a number of again anomalous properties and one of them being uh water's coherence and cohesion and adhesion right water actually forms two different types of um, molecular arrangements there's bulk water and there's um, structured water and water the water that is uh, inside that's part of the tube that's connecting the beakers is a is a structure of water a different kind of water so I don't have time to talk about all that but it's very interesting well oh, did you know that <laughs> The same water that was on, was on Earth a million years ago is still present today. That's just amazing. And wherever water is on Earth, life exists, even if it's boiling or burning acidic. So water helps drive the circle of life. This is another quote I love. Water is the driving force of all nature. So many of water's life-giving properties are all anomalous properties. Have you ever wondered why you feel so good near water? Um, yeah, actually, oftentimes, um, you know, people, I think that's why people might be attracted to the ocean for some, you know, some, it makes them yeah. feel really good to be in the yeah. water. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons. We love the sound of it, the recursive sound of the surf, uh, the, the smell. Water, especially ocean water, has a smell because of the molecules that are broken down. Um, but I'm talking, and I'm talking particularly about moving water. This is one of the things that water has negative ions as a result of its movement. It gives off negative ions. The negative ions do is they essentially clean the air. So they're generated by moving water and plants. And they, they actually attach to positive charged particles. And what are those? Dust, pollen, uh, mold, bacteria. And essentially they attach them and take them down. <laughs> you can just visualize how it's, it's a filtering cleaning system. And um, here are some uh, stats on places that give off magnets. You can see a country meadow, forest, and she seashore, and Niagara Falls. Look at Niagara Falls, 1,000, uh, 100,000 um, per kilogram. Sorry, is that? Yeah, let's see. Notice a city freeway or an office is only 100 because, in fact, the materials uh, that are there, or the exhaust given off, etc., create a positive, create positive ions. So there's more positive ions, and hence we have less negative ion atmosphere. So that's just, that's part of the freshness of things. I want to show you a little bit about the water cycle. Most people are learning about that in school. And of course, the water cycle is the hydrological cycle. It's a closed circle, as you can see. It's uh, I think she's reconnecting. There you are. Uh, Nina, your sound is muted. Laureen, your sound is muted. Are, are we uh, now see the back. slides still? Oh, we cannot okay, see perfect. your slides anymore, but we see you and we can hear you. Okay, maybe I have to green again. You can choose, uh, choose are we now up? the audio. Oh, I need to put the audio on. Um. 
I think the issues <laughs> are due to the network connections. I saw that um, there are some red flags for the Nina network connection. If there are too many data, maybe uh, we can try to speed it up a bit by disabling disabling the video for uh, um, Mrs. Montano. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Let's okay. See. Just trying to improve it. I was a just suggestion. thinking. Okay. Suggestion. Okay. Sure. That's so fine. So if you turn off your video, Nina, then I think your PowerPoint might have a little bit more fluidity. <laughs> okay. How do I turn my video off? There should be a button at the bottom left of your screen. There's one to mute and unmute you, and then there's. I be I've done it for one. you. Oh, perfect. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Least, try it. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Mihai. Yeah, I think that'll help because. Uh, yeah, we, we're good. Oh, so we are moving along. So again, just to reiterate, water covers 75% of the Earth's surface. And ironically, it's not so much ironically, humans bought human, the human body, it's the same thing. It's two thirds as well. So what we see is a fractal connection in water and in this case i just wanted to to bring up the connection be, between us see. and the rest of the planet so we are mostly water essentially is what i wanted to say we're more than two-thirds water and what this means if you consider the water cycle the hydrological cycle you can sense that that water is constantly moving and in different states going from solid, liquid, and, and vapor, and it exists in all those three states all the time. So water is in the air. And this is something that we, we tend to forget, that water is in the air. Of course, now with COVID, uh, I think we're more aware of things in the air and particles in the air, but most of those particles are, cover, are, are contained and carried via water vapor. So we are essentially breathing in water and we're breathing out water. So think of your closest water body that you are near. For me in Canada, it's Lake Ontario. And essentially, your water is the water of your closest water body. So that water that Florin just had a sip of, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. That's probably not his water. <laughs> Which is also why you shouldn't drink bottled water. In fact, you know, drinking the water of your watershed makes a lot of sense. It's your water. Yeah. And the connotations of that are actually quite profound. That's interesting. The bottom line, of course, is, is your water clean? Is that water body that's closest to you, is that water body clean? Just something to, to consider. I want to move on to uh, just a little bit about what lives in the water, what goes on in the water. So this is the circle of life. So this is a, a, an example of an aquatic ecosystem and the trophic levels. Very simple from the producers, the algae in this case, or the rooted plants, down to the consumers, and then we have the primary, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, these are all heterotrophs. And then we go, we continue the cycle to the decomposers. And the decomposers close the circle and, uh, and give nutrients back to the produ producers who, not, who need more than just the sun, they need the nutrients as well. So you can see it, it's a closed circle. Now I wanna just touch on uh, trophic level. Trophic level essentially means the level of energy so as we go move from producers to consumers, producers, of course, occupy the highest energy. They're closest to the sun. They're, they're grabbing the sun's energy. And then as we move further and further down, uh, creatures or organisms require more and more because they're getting less and less out of the whole deal. So one example that I want to talk about are whales whales essentially and something called a trophic cascade so i mentioned the trophic level or the different energy levels along a food chain 
And um, I'm just getting my notes again. I guess I've lost my notes. So a trophic cascade happens when an organism from a higher trophic level predates or preys on uh, an organism of a lower trophic level and then frees up the trophic level below it. And I'll show you an example of that here. So here is uh, two versions of a higher predator. You can see the big giant fish there. And it's feeding on the lesser fish who in turn feed on the zooplankton, who in turn feed on, on the phytoplankton. This is again, very simplified. You can see in the case in above where the larger fish is no longer there that allows the smaller fish to proliferate and they eat more zooplankton which liberates the phytoplankton. So there's something missing here and that's the nitrogen and the phosphorus. You can see that. So on the upper level if the, we get rid of the big fish then we have a lot of phytoplankton. But if they don't have the nutrients they're going to crash. So let's see how the whales fit into this. So the way it works with whales is they essentially go into the, go to the ocean depths to eat fish and krill. And then they return to the surface and release fecal plumes. And they're actually called punamis because they're big. <laughs> the whale is big. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the, never mind. Anyway, uh, they are called that. <clears throat> so what's wonderful is that the plumes create, they, they, um, they close that link, right? They create the nutrients for the phytoplankton to then flourish. And then the phytoplankton in turn are the food for the krill and the fish. So you can see this closed loop is formed. A wonderful cycle that the, the whale contributes to. Now here's an, an additional uh, thing to consider. And this is in fact how whales help to change climate. So their fecal plumes increase the phytoplankton, as I mentioned. And of course, phytoplankton we know take up CO2 from the atmosphere. And then they deposit it at the ocean bottom. And phytoplankton are often not thought of. We think of the forest. And of course, the forest is extremely important in terms of climate and balancing climate, but we forget, we do forget, we think of the oceans, but we don't think of these tiny, tiny creatures that occupy a huge portion of the ocean and, and are essentially the ocean's forest, microforest. And of course, this, this is gonna affect climate. So something to think on. So I wanna touch now on, on some of the weird residents that live in water. I'm just going to give you two examples. And one example is the rotifer. And the rotifer is a tiny microorganism, it's an invertebrate, that is sedentary. It attaches itself to, oh, there's a video here, to uh, detritus. This is a, a rotifer living in a pond. And it's a filter feeder. And this is viewed through a microscope and you can see it reaching out. So he, he basically eats plankton or uh, you know, algae and he's just released, he's opened up his, his two main uh, cilia. These are almost like a filichae that are twirling. And what he does is he creates a vortex, two vortexes that come in and feed feed the plankton that are, you know, going by if there's a current or just floating about into his stomach. And you can see the stomach constantly working and feeding into his digestive system. And he just kind of sits, he attaches himself with little feet onto some piece of detritus and feeds away. It's really an amazing little creature to watch. What's interesting, this is a deloid rotifer and they are all, they essentially reproduce by cloning. They're all female. There are no males, no male deloid rotifers. And your first question is, well, how do they succeed without uh, 
diversity from uh, sexual reproduction. Uh, they have existed for millions of years. They're one of the oldest organisms on the world, in the world. And what they use is essentially epigenetics and um, horizontal gene transfer. They will um, essentially, when, when they, uh, in fact, when they reach a time when there's not enough water, this is the other thing that they do, they're able to withstand no water. They uh, crumple up into a, a particular form. And when they come back, they're of course, uh, they needing to uh, fix their DNA that breaks up and they're stitching in while they're, while they're fixing their DNA, they're stitching in new material from the environment. That is so cool. <laughs> they are busy. Yeah, so um, they're able to achieve a diversity that way. So they're not complete clones, as it turns out. And they rely on, on uh, drying up of water and, and these types of things to go into a dormant state where they essentially rejuvenate. And from that, they create uh, new organisms. It's just amazing. Another one, which perhaps a number of people know about, because in a way, they're the poster child for weird life, is the tardigrade or the moss piglet. Uh, it's also called the water bear. And we can see why he's got, well, <laughs> he's again, very small. It's a very interesting uh, creature. Oh, oh, yes. And, and this, this creature eats the creature that you just saw before. He oh, eats wow. rotifers. He's bigger than the rotifer. The and he has... Um, it's like a vacuum. Yes. In <laughs> fact, that proboscis moves in and out. And that's how he feeds. And he, so he'll suck up that rotifer just like that. And he has eight little legs that he moves around with. And he's kind of lumbers. He's a lumbering creature. If you've seen him under the microscope, he kind of moves like a dirigible. And oh, again, it's, he's about a millimeter, slightly less than a millimeter long. So he's actually quite, wow. you, you can actually see them with the naked eye if you're looking for them. And they will live anywhere. This one here is, is on moss. You can see them on moss, on any, any place where there's going to be water. And it doesn't have to be uh, constant water, obviously. Uh, I'll just go to the next slide to show some of the things, some of his, his characteristics. Uh, water bears, um, like the rotifers, can uh, withstand uh, desiccation. They will go up, uh, they will shrivel up into something called a ton. And they have been revived after 100 years of desiccation in pieces of moss. Uh, they, you know, just add a drop of water. They're just like those gummy bear things. They're like those things, I don't know if you had them when you were a kid. You just put a drop of water and ploop, something <laughs> comes yeah. out of it. And okay. uh, they, they will do that. And again, they, they uh, secrete, they have a particular protein called trehulose that essentially covers their system. And so in fact, they go from a water bear to a jelly bear, to a, a gummy bear, uh, that kind of consistency. And that helps their DNA from breaking and other things from happening. And then when they're revived, they are viable. They've even gone into outer space. They've, they they uh, hitched a ride on one of the um, uh, <laughs> spaceships up there and they, wow. they did experiments and they brought them back down and they were able to reproduce. They're so really viable. They, they are, are found literally everywhere from the Himalayas to the ocean depths. I mean, withstanding great, great pressures and uh, also wow. high radiation. They've been found to uh, thrive in these, these scenarios and high temperatures and low temperatures. So literally everywhere. Very resilient creatures. And, and they're, they're living a lot of our dreams by hitching rides to space. Exactly. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Little hitchhikers. Indeed. So because creatures. of that, Amazing. because of that, because they can withstand radiation that is not normal for the planet because they can land pressures that are you know great even greater than what we have on earth 
and various other extremes. They're, they're called extremophiles. Wow. People have, have posited that they don't come from here, that they're little aliens <laughs> from somewhere. Heaven knows. Uh, given, given that so much water exists in the universe and our water has come to us from elsewhere, it's, uh, I'll leave that to other people to think about anyway. So I want to move on to motion. Water is motion. And water actually moves whether, I'm going to say it this way, whether it moves or not. Because in fact, we may it may look it's not in motion, but it is. And even even uh, water, for instance, in a tree or water in a cell, is going to be moving at a microscopic level. Water in a lake that may look sedentary. Lakes actually have tides; they're called seiches, and water is constantly swashing back and forth, not unlike coffee in a coffee cup when you're moving. It may look still, but it's actually in motion at some level. And, and it needs to continue to flow. So in, in flowing water particularly, and this is what I was studying in my master's uh, project, I was looking at, at what lives in streams and what affects them. And you'll notice that I give examples here of several types of creatures, mostly benthic invertebrates, mostly insects that are in their larval form. Most, many insects will spend their larval form in water and then emerge as adults later on. Most flies, uh, these are, several of these are, are flies. There's stonefly at the top, mayfly at the bottom left, uh, caddisfly to the right, and then there's uh, coronamids down below and black flies. So these are all what, some of the most common insects that are around. And you'll notice that they have streamlined bodies. I have better pictures of that. So this one is a stonefly. You'll notice how he hugs the, the rock. And he's there for, to uh, allow the current to pass through his gills and make the most out of the oxygen. These are all high oxygen creatures, they are indi indicators of clean water. That's a mayfly, and then down below is a dobson fly. These are all clean water species that require a current that re because the current brings in high oxygen, and they are, are feeding off the paraphyton that's on the rocks or, or on other creatures as well. The caddisfly is really interesting because what it does is it builds a case. It builds a, a house for itself that it either it's going to attach or move about with it like the hermit crab. And the houses that they build are reflective of where they are, the environment that they're in. So if they're in a fast moving cobble uh, stone creek, they will build their house out of little tiny stones and attach themselves. If they're in a slower moving environment, mostly with debris, detritus, leaves and stems, pieces of this and that, they will put their houses together with those materials and crawl about. Just fascinating creatures. So there's a, just like another example of the different types of houses that they built. And some again will stay put and others will be moving about. And it depends on their feeding habits. Uh, again, insects are such a huge group. They can be predatory or filter feeders or... We don't see the presentation. Um, we may have lost. Okay, we lost a signal, perhaps. Maybe a signal. She'll return. Yeah, yeah. Like the water. I love the quotes. She has a. Uh, 
She's muted. The mute teacher, teacher, yes. Me, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Please modify. You, please. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. There you are. Okay, I'm back. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> so moving on to the story of water. The water's story is our story. And our story is water's story. We're so connected to water. Uh, we would not exist without water. And I just want to just bring up one point, and that's what we do with water. This is uh, one of the largest dams in China. And it's interesting that I just want to talk about one statistic. We, we are very good. In fact, in Canada, almost too good at, at building dams. Most of the dams, largest dams, are in the Northern Hemisphere. This is just a, an interesting tidbit. And of course, the, the idea of the dam is to store water and to stop it from flowing where it normally does. So water, huge amounts of water are stored lo for longer periods of time than normally. And what this has actually done is created a higher weight of water in the Northern Hemisphere than normally. She'll be back. Yeah, yeah. There's, she's ebbing and flowing like water. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's the problem of uh, streaming of very interesting streaming of information. It's not always at the rate that we need. <laughs> we have a uh, questions, some questions coming in too. That's good. Super. Yeah. Oh, I saw Nina. You're muted, but we can see you there. There you are. Um. There you are. We can hear you now. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So I think I'd have to start all over again, but I'll, I'll get moving. Um, what do you see right now? Your, your, We see the PowerPoint. Are we moving through my PowerPoint? We see the PowerPoint. I'm just going to quickly go through to yeah, where we are. On the slide you were, you were um, on. What is water? It's now. What is water? Oh, really? Mm hmm. And now it's the, the slide where, oh, that's the cute little bug that travels in space, catches a free ride. <laughs> so we're moving forward. Okay, so we're moving forward a little bit here. Yeah. Yes. Is there one we should be looking for to stop at? Or can you see your screen? Or? I'm, I can only see one thing. <laughs> okay. Um, right now are we at water, water story? Discussion. No. It was the water, uh, now, yes, yes. water is story. Mm -hmm. And there's the uh, dam. Okay. So I was just mentioning that uh, it's the most, it's the odd thing that uh, I was just going to re recapitulate that as a function of all the reservoirs that we've created in the Northern Hemisphere, we've actually changed the way the earth um, turns by a fraction of, of an amount, but scientists have been able to notice that. So that's, that's just something as a function of the amount of water that is being detained. Uh, I just thought it was the most bizarre uh, thing to know. That I want to move, just as I'm getting to the end here. Yeah, it is. <laughs> to bottled water. <laughs> um, what we do to water. So what we do, what we've been doing with water isn't always smart. And this is one, this is the idea uh, behind 
bottled water is And we're in suspense now about the bottled water. <laughs> the only thing that we may do in order to help her with her internet connection is to close our video. cameras in order for okay. her not to load also our video stream. No problem. Uh, uh, anything else, uh, I don't think we can do, do okay. more for, for, for that. I'm going to um, turn off my video then. Can you hear me? No, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, as long as you can hear me, maybe I can just continue without the video, which is unfortunate. We turned off our video in hopes that it might give um, a little bit more bandwidth for your presentation. Okay, so let's see if that's it. the case. And I'll let you know when All we right. see. Can you see, can you see the screen now? Yes. Yes, and we are on the slide we were, we were at before, so we're good. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I, so I was just uh, talking about what, what we do with water and uh, bottled, bottled water is just one example of, of commodification of water, of our attitude toward water, which is to change as far as I'm concerned, uh, toward uh, respect and understanding water's preciousness. So instead of just it as a resource, as something to use, and I think this is extremely important. And that was just one example. One thing that we can certainly do is literally plant a tree. If we do nothing else, every single person on the, on the earth, on the planet, were to plant one tree, that would make a huge difference. What trees do, just like the phytoplankton, but trees very much do, is they help the balance of water, of the hydrological cycle. And this is, of course, the problem. In the cities and places where we don't have trees, the hydrological cycle is is out of balance. And this is, of course, what brings in uh, uh, drought and flood scenarios with impermeable surfaces. What trees do is they, uh, they, they serve as a filter system. They bring in water. They create water, literally. They allow water to percolate through and infiltrate the ground. And, and then they, in fact, they help with climate as well as a result. So what trees do is, is spectacular. They are like the uh, filtration system for water there. I'm trying to think of a, a better word. They're co-conspirators with water to balance not just climate, but everything else on the planet. They're amazing. I just want to also say that you, you're never too young to make a difference. And this, this uh, gal, she's 12 years old, Rachel Parent in Vancouver, Canada. And she let people know what she thought. She was doing a project against, uh, well, for the labeling of GMO products and made a difference. Next thing you know, she was on TV, et cetera, because of her passion and because of her, uh, her uh, her thoughts on, on the subject, and she just kept going, her tenacity, that's what I was going for. Very similar to Greta Thunberg, everybody knows what she did, and that was one person and a young person when they started. They're older now, and they're continuing their good work. So don't let someone tell you you're too young or you're insignificant. You can make a difference. Every single individual can make a difference. So some examples of things you can do, Adopt the closest water body and look at it. Um, organize a stream cleanup, clean it up, actually clean it up, get people together. What happens is you're bringing the community together, you're bringing awareness to, to that community, you're bringing in, con you're consolidating people, you're bringing them together in something that's worthwhile. And next thing you know, they're, look they're 
taking ownership of that water body. And once that happens, you're going to look at it like looking after your own house, right? Do a beach cleanup, same thing. I just want to quickly touch on an organization. It's a database. It's called the Watermark Project, watermarkproject.ca. What they do is they collect stories about water bodies that have left a watermark on someone, a mark, right? Uh, a feeling of something precious, of something important. And, and what they do is they collect stories and they put them on a huge data, on a map, a database and a map. And the, the, the stories are collected, so you just need to go on the map and find any place and you'll find all the stories about that water body. What those stories do, stories are powerful, is that they bring in, they bring in an, a, a sense of importance of that water body. That water body now is suddenly important because it's important to at least one person and it becomes important to others. So you can sign up for that with your story. Tell your story, put it in a Just quickly, the books I mentioned, the main book that uh, much of this talk comes from uh, is a compendium of shared stories, in fact, from various people around the world, experts, and myself, my own stories are in this book, Water Is. Um, and my latest book, which is about water, but it's, it's a fiction book, A Diary in the Age of Water, is about four generations of women and their relationship, their unique relationship to water during a time of great change. And I, think, uh, I personally think it's an exciting read. It's, it's based on real events, and then those real events uh, set up the premise for, for the book. So with that, I'm going to thank you for letting me be here and speak to you about something that's very precious to me. And you can find me here at these various places. And I'm very happy to share the talk with anybody. I know uh, we had some glitches here and there, but we got through it all. And I'm ready to answer any questions if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Good morning, Nina. Sorry, Depanovich. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, being with us and uh, share with us so wonderful information, so good information, interesting information. I have a question you. for you. Yes. Two days ago, we just host another interesting conference with uh, NASA folks which are involved yes. in the um, Mars mission. And as you know, maybe they're looking for what? In, on the Mars, they're looking for water. Yeah, yeah they definitely are. They found okay. water on any, Mars. Or evidence, any, evidence of water. Okay, any, any connection between NASA, actually between your work, uh, your research, and the folks from NASA? Because you're doing something uh, wonderful, something extraordinary. Definitely. Well, there's, a, there's an existential connection. I'm not uh, directly connected with NASA people. I've used their work in my work. I've used what they discovered in the work that I do, the communications that I, I, I report on water as well, on various magazines and blogs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly watching what they're doing and what they're discovering and what they're finding out in the universe. This is all about what NASA is doing. The fact that water is found black holes and in the sun and and how it's associated with the formation of stars and finding mar uh, finding water on Enceladus and finding evidence of water on Mars and, and in fact evidence of current water I believe there's ice there uh, it's coming and going and it's very very exciting what they're doing there um, but that's that's as far as my connection with them it's more one directional <laughs> um, they don't know i exist <laughs> but, but i certainly know they exist and they're doing wonderful work okay good and then the last uh, the last uh, question is regarding the can we be concerned about the existing of water um in a, in some parts of the world uh we have unfortunately they have no uh, no water People have no, yes. has no water. How about the future? You are optimist. Can be maybe uh, small places on the earth 
but can the earth face with the lack of water in the let's say future i don't speak about the next hundred years but maybe later on right well an odd piece of information is that in fact as i mentioned before, early in the talk is that the same amount of water is on the earth today falling on your rooftop as what existed in prehistoric times when the dinosaurs roamed the swamps of the Jurassic the same amount of water so it's not that we are, have less water generally in the globe what is happening is that we are finding water scarcity in certain parts and that is because water is diverted and the water cycle itself is being um, changed and, and uh, destroyed in space in, in its proper function. So there's much less water in certain places than, than normally. And there's more, much more water in other places. We have out in the flood scenario happening. And this is of course, partly climate change is changing the way the water is moving around the globe. Our own uh, activities are changing that as well. Deforestation, for instance, getting rid of the trees is affecting that same area in the microclimate area. The micro part of that water cycle is being affected because the trees are no longer there to actually create rain because trees create rain by evaporating, trans, you know, transpir transpiration. So what What's happening is there should be enough water for everybody. We're also polluting water. We're, so there's that part too. Fresh water is only something like 3% of the water that's on the earth. The rest is locked in glaciers and in the ocean, which we can't use unless we, well, we're coming up with desalination plants right now to access the ocean and to use ocean water in agriculture too. So the problem is really human made in a sense is what I'm trying to say. So places that have water scarcity that are uh, becoming desertified, et cetera, that's going to be exacerbated with climate change. It's gonna get worse and worse. The extremes are gonna happen. Likewise, places like uh, some parts of Canada, in fact, and some parts of Northern Europe are going to be having flood scenarios and they already are. We're constantly seeing now, instead of every 100 years, a 100 year flood, we're seeing those same kind of floods happen almost every year. And that is what's happening is the water cycle is unbalanced. So to answer your other part of your question, am I optimistic? Yes, I, I, I want to be optimistic and I'm telling myself to be optimistic, but in fact, but in fact, what has to happen is we have to change what we're, how we do things. And if, if the pandemic is showing us anything, the pandemic, in fact, is, is a symptom of, is part of what's going on with climate change. It's not a separate thing. They are all interlinked to what we are doing, our aggressive actions and inability to essentially uh, be participants of what's going on on the planet, of part of the planet, to be part of a global community acting together as opposed to acting as aggressors. So essentially what's happening is, to be in a nutshell, it's an aggressive response to our aggression. So I don't know if that answers your question, Soren. But thank you, thank you very it's much. A, it's a cautionary, a cautionary optimism. If, if we change, which I think we can, and we will, we have, and COVID is, if COVID teaches us anything, it's that we can change. And I think there are a number of us, of us that are seeing that we need to live more lightly on the planet. And then the planet will adjust accordingly. In some ways it's as simple as that. Thank you very much, Nina. Florin, uh, Heather, please. I believe that this kind of uh, discussions around uh, such an important topic must be uh, one per month, Nina. And uh, uh, I, uh, if you agree, I uh, try to create a, a short uh, program 
uh, schedule and I send to you and accordingly we can find a solution to discuss this, uh, uh, not only in this uh, event like Atlantic, but I believe that we can, I have some information ab about the informational part of the uh, water because uh, this kind of ontological dimension of information uh, pro prove us that uh, water is a sort of uh, connector with the uh, profoundness of uh, um, of information without time and space. Yes. So it's so important. More than that, uh, we had we have uh, I had the chance to meet uh, uh, um, important professors that uh, discovered in Romania a Romanian one. He discovered the idea of uh, aquapurina. That it's a protein in the cell that in the um, uh, how you say the boundary of the cell that uh, uh, permits the circulation of water inside the cell inside the body because it's not so easy it's not trivial how um, the water we know that we are 75 percent of water but we didn't know how the water uh, move inside the body and the yes. aquaporina yes. is a new domain and uh, I had the chance to meet uh, 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 Professor Tanaka in uh, Japan that it's a guy that discovered some very strange uh, streaming of water inside the brain and he had a very interesting uh, um, theory but not only theory the, uh, uh, that uh, the brain itself is a sort of interface that it's able to have uh, uh, quantum physics uh, properties so what seems yes. to be so so yes. so important is this new orthophysical <laughs> approach we have oh, information definitely Sorry. The work that, that Lipton is doing with, with yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the boundary yeah. effect of water, structured water, interstitial water versus and, uh, you know, bulk water, etc. We had the chance to make some uh, experiments, uh, even with my students, uh, in this idea of Gaia vision. And uh, we can uh, uh, discuss it and to propose, uh, I told you, I am very fond of the idea that the society can be involved in research. Because some of them needs, uh, some of researchers needs a very high technique, but some of them are easy and need a lot of uh, creativity in mind. So the problem is to put the, on the uh, um, internet, uh, to put on the global scale uh, questions and uh, materials and uh, uh, yes. problems, and uh, this needs some discussion because it's very useful to, to that the society heard about this subject from different uh, uh, personalities in different from different cultures, different countries. Not only for uh, uh, only a guy like I was until now, a Romanian, a Romanian guy with a mountain man, <laughs> Montano, <laughs> uh, with complexity science. Uh, if you uh, if you start to say something about complexity, they said, ah, you met uh, Montano. I ah, yes, see it, Montanisme. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's uh, excellent. Uh, it, it's important Florida to would, see. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, Florian, I would love to be part of that. Uh, I think that's an, an that's a brilliant idea. Brilliant. And and I would be honored to be part of that. I Thank agree. I totally agree. We need to have that discussion out there and have it as far, you know, reach as many people as possible. Yes. Because that's a paradigm changer. Yes. That's a paradigm yes. changer and we need to change our paradigms. And so that's very much connected to what I was saying before. Yes. how COVID is, is, is almost like we've reached a, some point here with, with COVID, not just with climate change. Climate change is still an issue, obviously still an issue, but COVID has somehow tipped the whole world in a way. Yes. And it's an opportunity, a great opportunity to open this discussion and to, to find new directions that are much more sustainable and are, are uh, going to, you know, going to help us in our, in our uh, changing ourselves, our increasing our, elevating our consciousness yes. and moving forward as a global community. A very, very nice uh, lady. Uh, I like her very much. She is in the London School of Economics, uh, uh, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, she said like that, expose the people to the complexity science. Don't like to, don't, don't, don't try to teach them. Expose them uh, and they will absorb and metabolize uh, this new vision because uh, complexity science is not only uh, a list of uh, tools or a, a concept of some models. It's a new fashion of seeing this kind of interaction that means uh, uh, Gaia vision. So 
Yes, I, I, yes, Gaia I, vision, exactly. Yeah. That's it. Uh, we have, I had the chance to put in Romanian Academy uh, this kind of program, uh, Gaia Vision, and uh, I had the chance to travel. The, let's say one of our expedition was on the top of volcano in uh, uh, Reunion Island, and there we make some experiments and uh, we understood a little bit uh, how the life begin after an eruption and this kind of interaction be between geosphere, biosphere, and noosphere. So we have some background. Uh, even experimental background uh, using uh, complexity science, but yes. personally, I was yes. not uh, I was not fun to write down article uh, just to be known uh, as a, a contributor to this domain. But uh, I had a lot of students, I had a lot of people, and I believe that the, in this new fashion of communication through internet, we can create a wave of consciousness. And uh, I, I, I exciting I am so excited to start it. Oh, that's perfect. And what a okay. gorgeous metaphor. Let's create, let's create a wave. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, Nina, thank you very much to be here with us. Oh, thank and, you so uh, much. It's, thank uh, you, Florin, Heather, Soren, Mihai. It was wonderful. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Thank you for all your messages to our young people around the world. And we're, we'll make sure we keep, uh, keep the conversation going. You know, of course, it will be causing yeah, ripples. Yeah, definitely. Another yeah, method. and and again, just to remind everybody, uh, there, I have two handouts available, I believe, now on the website for anyone yeah. to upload. I think, yeah. and they're uh, uh, summaries some of the things that I mentioned about water, but also the the second one is about what you can do. So uh, it has some of the information that I talked about, which I hope will will take take a look at. Thanks again, Paul. That was wonderful. Nina, you live in uh, Toronto? Yes, near Toronto. Near Toronto. We have a good friend, which is vice president of Four Genesis Foundation. It's about, it's the, maybe you know him, Mr. Cornelio Kishu. He was the only Romanian uh, member of the Canadian Parliament for years. Oh, yes, yes. You, do you know him? Is your, oh, cool. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I've heard the name. I don't, I don't know okay. him personally. Oh, wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's a special See, person. It's cool a special people person. in Canada. <laughs> yes. Many too. And uh, of course, you, you got know, it. sorry, you know my uh, friend and at the same time my ex-student uh, uh, that uh, it's Claudio Murgan. He was a very important guy in our team. Yes, and, yes. Uh, that's a, it's a interesting, this kind of uh, interactions that uh, the nature knows how to, to put them together, you know. Oh, okay. definitely. Because, oh, because you mentioned Claudio Morgan, he will be after us, after this conference in uh, 20 minutes, he will be live uh, on, uh, on uh, Zoom on uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because he will have a short conference, actually one hour, I think one hour and a half about his books. He's a science yep. fiction writer. I like your, yep. uh, by the way, your email, your, yeah, your email. It's a sci-fi girl. Is that correct? SF yeah, girl? <laughs> that's yes, it is. Yeah, you got it. SF girl. Okay. <laughs> like a superhero. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, I just put on my uh, uh, Facebook page a uh, uh, list of uh, books that uh, Nina uh, has uh, right in science fiction uh, domain. It's, they are amazing because, uh, you know, it's very interesting uh, when a, a person that has a scientific uh, uh, basis like uh, complexity science that it's uh, already non-linear, not normal, uh, with so many news uh, and so on. To write, uh, to, to share with the society in a science fiction way, it's amazing. And uh, she has this. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. Ability. It's a lot of fun, Florence. Yeah, yeah. You must uh, publish you, in Romanian too. You need to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I shall try. Yes. Try. Yes. <laughs> Nina, you need to. You need to publish uh, in Romanian too. Romanian language. I agree. I agree, Soren. I have okay. two books published in Romanian, but I need more of them done that way. You're right. Okay. 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 Yeah. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Florine, Heather, for um, uh, managing this conference. Nina, for uh, accept to be our guest. Good conference. So I'll be happy that uh, the conference will be online. Online will be in the virtual area. Florine Montano, Excellent. take care about Heather and my, my other colleagues. I wish you to have a good summer. And uh, hope you. to you hear too. you and to see you soon. 
Thank you, Sarin. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.